You are listening to the Embrace What Matters podcast. My name is John Mahalik. I'm a seminary-trained author and speaker with over 25 years' experience encouraging others in the areas of spiritual life change and authentic relationship. My goal is to bridge the things of eternity with everyday experience. The current episodes in this podcast are sermons that I delivered while pastoring a church in the country of Honduras. If this podcast encourages you and helps you, can I ask that you please write a review and leave a rating? It will simply help more people find the podcast who may, like you, be searching for more purpose and meaning. Thanks again for listening, and enjoy this week's episode. I have the fun task because I'm in, I've decided to do a very long series uh, encompassing much of the uh, calendar year here at Union to repeat what I'm talking about because we have new people every week. Uh, the series is called Belonging to Him. And uh, it's about belonging to God. What does that mean? Uh, how does that uh, affect our Christianity, our Christian walk? Uh, how does that affect the way we approach Scripture, the salvation story, uh, et cetera, et cetera? It's based on the idea that uh, we all have this need for relationship in our lives, this need for personal relationship. And so it's really taking a look at a lot of familiar themes based on that idea. Uh, the last number of weeks, we've been looking at our, our at different needs. We've been looking at our need for uh, loving relationship. We need love in our lives. What does that look like with God? Uh, but also we need true relationship. What does that look like in our relationship in belonging to him? Uh, so this morning, we're going to be looking and transitioning to our need for transcendent relationship. Uh, what does transcendent mean? To transcend means to rise, to go above. Um, We get a lot of needs met in our human relationships, our our need for love, our need for truth. Uh, A lot of needs are met that way. Uh, But humans are imperfect. Humans uh, have limitations. Uh, We're sinful despite our best desires and intentions. And we have a limited view of things. We have a limited wisdom, whereas God is all-knowing, God is all-wise. So we need transcendent relationship. There has to be more to the life that we live now. And so one of the ways I've approached this series is it's something that can help us as, as Christians, as, as servants and people who serve other people and minister to other people, but it's also a way to speak about God to other people. Uh, it's what I call a relational apologetic. So how can we speak to, to the, the need that people have that there has to be something more? There has to be something more than the way humans do things. Um, that, that is a selling point, certainly for Christianity, um, but also it ties it in with how can we have transcendent relationship. So we're going to be touching on that the next uh, few weeks. The f- topic we're going to be talking about this morning is, is freedom in relationship. I'm going to be piggybacking a little bit on some stuff that we've talked about in the last few months. Uh, we talked about a number of uh, mo- uh, weeks ago on worldview, on the fact that there are ways that our human way of looking at things can make God unknown to us, uh, separate us in relationship uh, to God. Uh, and I also talked about the issue of autonomy, how we, we have this drive for self-determination. Um, so those are going to be tie in t- this morning. But... I want to talk about it in the context of transcendence. Uh, How do we look at freedom in a transcendent way, in a holy, godly way, as opposed to the way that human beings uh, tend to look at the issue or the concept of freedom? And so to do that, I'm going to pick on something that we all care about. Uh, I realize that a number of people in the room are not from the United States, but many of us are. Uh, Many of those who are not from the United States are from countries that are related or have some some, uh, inclusion of democracy in them and freedom. Uh, So this is really kind of a coincidence. This topic was on the calendar, but I believe today is is Veterans Day in the United States. Uh, And then then we just had a, a big election a midterm election in the United States. So if you follow the news like I do, that's something I've had on my mind for a while. Uh, So it's really just kind of a coincidence, maybe, that I'm talking about this topic this morning. 
But our idea of freedom, in my view, is really influenced heavily if we're from, uh, from a democratic country by the political view of freedom. Uh, and, it's, and it's deeply seated in all of us, right? The, the, the founding fathers of the United States cared deeply about freedom. They decided that it was wrong for somebody, some country that was across the ocean to tell them how to live their lives. So they wanted self-determination. They wanted self-governance. And that is a deeply seated virtue in, in many people who live in a democratic country. And that is not a bad thing. That is something that we should celebrate. Veterans Day, Memorial Day, these are things that where we, we, we honor men and women who have fought and died for our freedom. So this is not something that we should take lightly. This is something that we should celebrate. However, as, as virtuous and wonderful as these freedoms are in the political sense, the social, the civic sense, they, they are a limited way to look at freedom. They are not completely transcendent. And the problem becomes when we want to live a Christian life and live free as Christians, sometimes our human views of freedom can corrupt or get in the way of the way God wants us to look at something like freedom. The founding father said, we have a God-given right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So again, these are absolutely virtuous things, right? We do have these rights and we should celebrate, for instance, the fact that in in a democracy, we have the right to worship. We have the right to speak freely. I think one of the reasons that democracy or or free countries are God-ordained is it allows us to spread the gospel freely. There are all sorts of places in the world where that is not allowed. And we complain sometimes in democracies where those rights are being curtailed, but you can go to all sorts of places in the world where you cannot say anything (laughs) about that is Christian or anything that is biblical. And so that is a right that should be celebrated. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are things that should be celebrated, that that, that we have that freedom. However, it is not the fullest scope of freedom that we should be focusing on. There is a difference between political, social freedom and transcendent freedom, the freedom that we have in the kingdom of God. There is a difference between the two. Matthew 6 is something that many of us quote, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So the context of the sermon that, that, he's, that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 6 is, has a lot to do with materialism, material needs, things like that. Those are things that we, you and I deal with every day. But where I'm heading is, is those are not the only things that we focus on and deal with every day. There are other things that we think about on a human level that sometimes get put above God's kingdom. God's kingdom, the kingdom of God. So this is the instance that he's talking about in Matthew 6. The kingdom of God very often is placed on the same level in our focus, in our attention, as our material needs. But the problem with that, and the problem with really anything that is not, that is material, that is human based in the human condition, when we put them on the same level, it usually goes like this. The material needs usually end up influencing the kingdom focus. Jesus says, you can't serve two masters. For either one, you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. One of them has to be the master. One of them has to be above. The, the idea that we could kind of do this never really works. So when it comes to a material focus, money, clothes, that kind of thing, Jesus says it's not going to work. You know, it, it's, usually the material stuff is going to filter down into the kingdom stuff, and your human view of things is going to be running you. You're not going to be living a kingdom life. And I would say the same thing can apply 
to our political ideals, our ideas of how we define freedom. Again, if you're from a democratic country like I am, you've spent your whole life in school affirming freedom, and it should be celebrated. Again, elections matter, right? Who we elect to office absolutely matters. Every vote counts, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're seeing in the news right now. All these things matter. They are, they are not separate from God. They can be very much God-ordained. They have real-world consequences, how well people are treated, whether people have equal right to things. Those are godly things, right? But when we put them on the same level or we assume that they're, they're equal, it becomes a problem. Jesus separated very much political ideals from kingdom ideals. He said, render under Caesar or the political system the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. He had no problem seeing that there was a level of separation. So what that says to me is that, that if you're someone who's a social activist or, or you get people to the polls or, or you're, you're someone that cares about equality, gender equality and all sorts of stuff and you're, you work in those social fields like that, that's absolutely a virtuous thing. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not unbiblical. But it, the problem is, is, is if you place that at such a level where you're, 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 most, of, most of your life is focused on that, and the kingdom of God is kind of here to you, again, your political ideals of freedom sometimes can become predominant over God's idea of freedom. All right, so let me spell this out a little bit. The kingdom of God should be above all, right? Seek God's kingdom. Everything should be underneath. Material needs, our social concerns, and our political ideals. When we do that, then we get to enjoy God's creation, right? God, the, the vision of God's kingdom gets to filter down to our material needs such that we don't live in anxiety over those needs. It filters down to define how could, should our social concerns serve the kingdom, Right? If we care about equality, that kind of thing, how should, that, how should God's word, God's kingdom define those things? In the same way with political ideals, democracy, freedom, independence. How should those things be defined by the kingdom of God? So here's a way to talk about it. This is a stock photo of a homeless man. He has a sleeping bag watching people go by. Let me ask you a question. Is this man free? Is he free? Now, based on our human ideals or sense of of, of liberty and freedom, the way we would define it, we might say yes. Well, again, we're just making stuff up here based on this photo. Maybe he doesn't have to go to a job, so he's free, right? Doesn't have to report to a job. He, He lives outside, doesn't have an electric bill doesn't have a mortgage to pay, so he's free from that. Maybe he doesn't have any, any relationships that he's tied down to, right? So he's free from that. So is he free? He can make choices. He can go wherever he wants. He can do whatever he wants. So from a human ideal that, that freedom is defined by doing what you want to do, self-determination, we would say a guy like this would be free. But is he free? Again, look at the expression on his face maybe not so free. Is it possible for us to live in a country or countries where we have freedom, where we can do what we want to do within reason and still be in bondage? Are there different types of freedom and different types of bondage? Could I live in a free country and be in bondage to addiction? A lot of people who are homeless or addicted. Could I be in bondage to depression? Low self-esteem? Can I be in bondage to bitterness and prejudice and hatred? Yeah. Those are areas of bondage where we are not free. And there are areas of bondage that can't be resolved through elections and constitutions and democracy, through politics, and very often through social activism when it's 
empty of God's directive and God's kingdom. Freedom isn't just about the ability to choose. There's more to it than that. Freedom isn't just about the external things that we can do in our lives, go here, do what, you know, not have obligations, make our own choices. There's more involved, right? There are heart issues. It's internal. Ultimate freedom isn't just external, it's internal. So a guy like that might be free in many areas that we would define freedom, but internally, not so free. So what is transcendent freedom? Here's a couple of ways to look at it. Transcendent freedom is defined not just by our freedom to choose, but also by the quality of life that results from our choices. Another example, I could choose to drink alcohol, right? It's my choice. I can drink alcohol. And if I choose to drink alcohol such that I become chemically addicted to the alcohol, I develop cirrhosis of the liver, I lose my job, my family, and maybe die an untimely death, how free am I in my freedom? Freedom is more than just what I choose to do. It's the quality of life that I have as a result of my choices. That's freedom, transcendent freedom. Transcendent freedom is also found when our choices move beyond our right to our own independence, to a life that is guided by the bonds of godly relationship. I'll repeat that. Transcendent freedom is found when our choices move beyond our right to our own independence to a life that is guided by the bonds of godly relationship. So hopefully you can hear the difference between the way we look at freedom and democracy and the values we hold for self-determination politically, socially, civically to God's idea of freedom. So I want to talk about three things that distinguish freedom and godly relationship. Number one, freedom and godly relationship outweighs our right to self-government. The founding fathers in the United States, that was a key term, self-government. England does not have the right to tell us how to govern our lives. Right? We have the God-given right to pursue our own life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have the right to do that, to determine our own lives. And that is deeply seated in our value systems. And that's not a bad thing, right? Remember we talked about the hierarchy. It's not a bad thing. But spiritually, morally, internally, that doesn't solve all of our problems. So, Genesis 2. This gives us an encapsulation of this concept. The Lord God commanded the man, Adam, and he said, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. So this is an encapsulation, so to speak, of God's idea of governance, the way God intended, at least in the beginning, and I would say now through Christ, the way he wants to govern us. Is Adam free under this governance? Now, I don't know how big the the, the, uh, Garden of Eden was, how many trees, but I would assume there were a number of trees. And he says, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, right? And that was probably a lot of trees. So did Adam have a lot of freedom under God's governance? He He had a lot of freedom. Just this one tree I don't want you to eat from. Just this one tree I don't want you to eat from. And then the problem came when the devil shows up and he paints a different picture of God. The serpent, the devil, said to the woman, Eve, did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And so the devil's tactics are are typically to misalign God's character. And in this case... What, part of what he's doing with Eve 
and eventually to Adam is misaligning the way God governs, saying that God is trying to hold you back. He says, you will not surely die. You can make choices of self-determination and there won't be consequences. For God knows that when you eat of the tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. The lie, the temptation that the devil was trying to get across and take mankind into was that God's trying to hold you back. God is trying to constrain you and control you. He doesn't want you to be free. He, he's worried that you're going to become like him. The real freedom is, is being like him and having the knowledge of good and evil. That's freedom. That's what you really want. God's trying to constrain you and hold you back. So Adam and Eve take the apple or the fruit from the tree, and what's the result? Freedom? Not freedom. <laughs> bondage. A bondage that we could talk about for a long time, right? Bondage that lasts up till today, death, suffering, bondage. <laughs> The result of their act of self-determination outside of God's governance wasn't freedom. It was bondage. Picture of a cute dog behind a fence. I've worked in prison ministry, and one of my teachers brought up this this illustration once. He he talked to the guys, and he said, you know, you guys are, sometimes you're like dogs behind a fence, and you got that look on your face. Man, I want to be outside this fence, whether it was in prison or anywhere, right? They felt constrained. Boy, it would be great if I could be free, was the dog saying, right? I want to get out there. I want to chase the rabbits. I want to do whatever, right? And the funny thing is, having come to Honduras, I have a slightly different perspective on on this now. There are some dogs that live behind fences in in Honduras. There are a lot of dogs who do not live behind fences in Honduras, (coughs) And as, you know, sad, the sad look on this little dog's face, he does not look like most of the dogs that I see that live outside the fences here in Honduras. How do those dogs look? Emaciated, starving, disease-ridden, right? The temptation of the dog, right, his perspective is that if I could just get outside this fence and do my own thing, boy, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. I'm going to be good. But what he doesn't realize is that his truest provision, his truest sense of safety, his truest sense of connection is inside the fence. (laughs) That's where his master is. That's where his freedom is. He's, He's Comparing the freedom outside the fence with the freedom that he really has inside the fence. He's defining freedom based on his choice to go outside the fence. But if you just stay inside the fence, his collective life would be free. But he doesn't see that. And neither do you and I. There is no true freedom without governance. Again, shies away from our democratic way of looking at freedom sometimes. But there's really no true freedom without governance. So the question is, under which governance is my ultimate freedom to be found? In myself or in my creator? The answer for Genesis 3 and what the devil was pitching as Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Jesus is Lord. What does that counteract? You shall be as gods, right? The temptation is I can be my own God. I can make my own life, determine the way things should be. I'm living in bondage as a result of that. You want to really be free, Jesus needs to be Lord. You need to choose him as your master and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. What does that counteract? What lie does that address? You shall not surely die. There's no consequences for your actions. Well, when I understand that God needed to raise Jesus from the dead, (laughs) Jesus died 
for my sin. (laughs) So that's an admission that my life on my own terms doesn't work, that there are consequences. The wages of my sin are death. There are consequences. So freedom in godly relationship outweighs my right to self-government, but it leads to freedom, transcendent freedom, which leads us to number two. Freedom in godly relationship trades one master for another. Romans 6. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. I I wonder if he was putting free in quotes there. (laughs) What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? (laughs) We probably asked that question before, haven't we? Man, what did I really get out of that choice? (laughs) Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. The quality of your life is free. But how does that happen? You've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. You've traded one master for another. And again, if we're honest, that does not sit well with our sense of human freedom. What? I'm a slave? I'm not going to be a slave to anybody. No one's going to tell me how to run my life. And there is an, an acceptable understanding that there is a horrible version of slavery. When it's left to man's terms, slavery is a tragedy. It's an evil, right? Human beings are not meant to be oppressed and all of their will taken from them, abused, right? Given no human value. So often throughout the history of man, that's been a definition of slavery, And so that's hard for us to get around. But you can't read the New Testament, especially Paul's letters, without dealing with the idea of slavery. Slavery is used all the time, partly because it was so predominant in their culture, but also because it has spiritual merit to consider the concept of slavery as opposed to spiritual freedom. And one other thing I will say is Not all versions of slavery back in Paul's time or Jesus' time was that abuse. There were lots of things that were called slavery that were very similar to you and I signing a contract of employment, right? Or a marriage or a covenant, right? Or having a debt that I need to pay off, right? When I sign a contract and I say, I'm going to pay this in six months, that's a form of slavery. I'm, I'm restricted to obey something, right? When I sign a contract of employment, I'm saying, I'm going to work for this long, I'm going to, I'm going to meet these conditions, and if I don't, there'll be consequences. So, so the slavery is not, a, is not a good term. And there have been horrible evils and abuses when it comes to slavery. But one reason I think Paul could talk about it so fluently was not every issue of slavery was abusive back then. So, but despite what you and I could debate about the issue of slavery. Spiritually, slavery was a no-brainer, right? The fall, sin, we are enslaved to sin, to the consequences of the fall. So the concept of slavery from a spiritual standpoint was was a no-brainer, such that Jesus or Paul was saying here, look, you were slaves to sin. What you really needed to be is slaves to God. So it wasn't this horrible, at least in that context back then, this horrible thing word to use. The term is relatively, you know, accurate. The difference, though, is where it, under the abusive conditions, someone who is, is put into slavery against their will. As Christians, we volunteer. We volunteer to give our lives over to Jesus. 
We volunteer to put our will and submit ourselves and to serve in the capacity that a slave might, meaning giving everything they are to their master. We do that voluntarily, right? And it gets to the idea that despite all the evil masters we've seen throughout history, God is a good master. God is a loving master. Jesus loves us. So these are hard things to wrestle with, and I, and I don't have all the answers. But it is important to understand this, and if you shy away from it because you find all, all ways to look at slavery as abhorrent, then it's going to be hard for you really to give your life to Jesus' lordship. You're never really going to see the fact that whatever term you want to use, you've got to give your life to Jesus in every way. You're never going to get it if you're constantly constrained by the human way we look at freedom. Susan Dunn says this, the Holy Spirit enables us to act in ways that are contrary to the natural impulses of our sinful nature, meaning our enslavement to sin. We are released to be loving, patient, kind, faithful, and good. Right? The freedom is we can finally be the person that God wants us to be, the person that we've always wanted to be. That's the problem with just living life on human terms. It's not transcendent. All of us know that there's more to being a a better person that we can be on our own terms. (laughs) We know that there's something beyond who we now are. How do we get there? We can't do it based on our own way of looking at things based on our own power. We need something that's transcendent. The freedom in godly relationship releases us to be that person, to be the person that God wants us to be, that we want to be, that others around us want us to be. That's freedom. Number three, freedom in godly relationship compels us to give up our lives for the freedom of others. For Christ's love compels us 2 Corinthians 5, he died for all, that all those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Freedom and godly relationship compels us to give up our lives for the freedom of others. Veterans Day, Memorial Day, we should absolutely honor our veterans We should absolutely honor those who have died for our freedom. That we don't do that in in the fullest capacity is an absolute shame. But that's not the only person who ever died for our freedom. The freedom that people died for in the area of democracy is in many ways a holy thing. Again, we live in a free country where people have equal rights, where people can spread the gospel freely. Those are all virtuous, in many ways, holy things. But do they get to every level of bondage? Do they solve all the problems of bondage? No. Jesus died for our freedom. Jesus died for our freedom. And 2 Corinthians 5, that's what we're supposed to do too. Again, freedom and godly relationship compels us to give up our lives for the freedom of others. Another way to say this is God doesn't just want us to be free from bondage. He wants us to be free for each other. You hear the difference? Not just free from, but free for Many in the room work with people that live in bondage, various types of bondage. So let's, let's say addiction. If you try to get somebody free from addiction, you cannot just get them clean. If they're clean from the addiction, that's not the total picture of their freedom, right? Jesus talks about the bondage of, of uh, uh, demon possession. He says, if someone gets clean of the demon possession and they don't do anything else, they're going to go right back to it and be worse, That happens all the time in addiction. 
You get someone clean of addiction and they have nothing to replace it with, right? That need that they were trying to fill with the addiction, they're just going to go back into bondage. It has to be replaced with something that meets the need that we were trying to get met by pursuing the addiction. We can't just be free from the things that hold us back. We have to be free for something. And in this case, we have to be free for others in relationship. Galatians 5. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. Right? See it? Don't just be free from the, the indulgences of the sinful nature. Replace it. Serve one another in love. So just like freedom is beyond just what we choose to do, but also the quality of our lives that result from our choices, the completion of our freedom is to be free for one another in relationship, free to love, free to serve, free to give, to give our lives. That's freedom. There's a photo of Christy and Lily. There are a number of people in the room that serve people in love, probably everybody. But we have different ministries, people work in schools, different ministries. Do they look free to you? Look free to me. Now, do they ever have challenges and struggles? <laughs> yeah. Has Christy probably worked with someone before that she's lost, right, that, that did not want the freedom that God wanted for them? Yeah. And again, Christy probably would tell you that she's given up a lot of the things that she would like to do in her life in order to serve a little girl like this. But is she free? Looks free to me. Not only is Lily free, but Christy's free. Freedom. There's more to just choosing our own life that brings us freedom. Too often, making those choices over and over to try to fix the problem puts us into more bondage. Will we live under the governance of God? We should celebrate our freedoms, democracy, elections, veterans, constitutions, flags. We should celebrate those things. But the only way to truly enjoy those freedoms, the only way to really see the value in all those things is to put them under the governance of God, to put ourselves back inside the fence or really allow God to do that for us. When we make that choice to give up our self-government, to choose one master for another, to give our lives to other people, to some degree we get put back inside the garden. It's not complete yet, but we get put, put back inside the garden. We get put back inside the fence. We get to enjoy the freedom that comes from godly relationship, the freedom of knowing that I belong that I'm safe, that I have a purpose, that life means something, that freedom only shows up through transcendent relationship. We can't do it on our own. We can't. No matter how hard we try, we can't. We need to give our lives up to the bonds of godly relationship and thereby live as free men and women. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're humbled by the fact that you stick with us when we so often turn from you, that we're constantly pushing against the fence and maybe jumping it from time to time and, and always thinking that there's more freedom outside where we want to remain inside your provision, inside your guidance, inside your safety. So, Lord, I ask that you give us a sense of what your freedom means in our lives, how it relates to the way we look at things like politics and elections and constitutions and democracy. 
and how it relates to the way we govern our own lives. Lord, I pray for the courage for us to voluntarily lay our lives down to your governance, to your lordship. And then if there is anyone who has never really done that this morning, I ask that you give them the urging and the guidance to make that decision. Lord, my life is not working on my own. Lord, I need you to be the master and the savior of my life. And for those of us who have been following you for so many years, but have been influenced too often by our human ways of viewing things, I pray that you can restore us to your vision and that you can restore the enjoyment and the blessedness of living in human ways when it comes to materialism and politics and social issues and and our human relationships. I ask that our kingdom focus takes us to a place where those things can be redeemed, put into their proper perspective and given a sense of godly purpose. I pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 2 Corinthians 3 says, the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. My prayer for this week and your coming days is that you walk in that freedom and understand a sense of what it means to be free, body, soul, and spirit. Have a great week. This podcast is produced by Embrace What Matters Ministries and is available most anywhere podcasts can be found. I encourage you to subscribe, share, and please leave a comment or send me an email. To learn more about this ministry, my devotional book, and other writings, please visit EmbraceWhatMatters.com.